We're here to discuss this on IF case. We have Dr. Vivian Schneidman, a forensic psychiatrist, and John Laurel, a trial lawyer and former federal prosecutor. Doctor, I want to start with you. Uh, so much was uh, focused on uh, Johar in the courtroom there, his lack of remorse slumping in his seat. I would think this probably had some effect on the outcome in terms of him getting the death penalty, in your opinion. What would, what would you say? I'm sure it did. I would think that um, people would th were probably thinking that he didn't care about the trial and didn't care about the outcome. But I don't think that we can draw a conclusion about somebody's thinking based on their behavior. Mm, I know that you, you obviously can't diagnose him. You weren't there with him. But if you were to look at it, this is a quick case in point. What would you say about this young boy? I mean, he really didn't show any remorse. He didn't take the stand. I guess the defense did not want him to take the stand. How would you kind of diagnose him in any form or fashion? Well, I'd have to say, first of all, I can't diagnose him because I never evaluated him. Mm -hmm. But I would want to know a few things. Mm -hmm. I'd want to know, first of all, was he medicated? Mm -hmm. You know, there are a lot of powerful psychotropic medications that can make somebody look really apathetic. And doctors might have thought they were helping him to feel calm and they were really making him look completely tranquilized. Mm. I don't know if that happened or not. He may have been advised by his attorneys to not show any emotion. I don't know why they would do that, but that might have been part of their legal advice. Um, and he may himself have thought that to show no emotion would have somehow made him look a certain way. Without actually asking him, there's no way to know. Right. Um, I don't think that there was any psychiatric component to this, mm -hmm. to this trial. Mm -hmm. I think that a psychiatric evaluation might have added a lot of information to a trial like this one. We have all sorts of complications here, and Doctor, I want to get back to you in a second, but this whole issue of lethal injection, the cocktails that are put together, there have been problems with that. What do we face here in this particular case? Many, many problems throughout the states. There's concern that it's cruel and unusual punishment because the lethal injection does not necessarily work. So people are suffering during the death process. However, on the federal side, it's been carried out in the McVeigh case. Um, it was carried out successfully. I don't think that's an avenue of an appeal either. Dr. Schlapp, I'm going to get back to you on this. There's been a lot of concern and contention as to whether or not he should spend life behind uh, bars in prison and a maximum uh, facility or the death. Some say that if he dies, he'll be a martyr. Can you tell us perhaps what it might be like for somebody in a maximum security jail uh, in prison 23 hours in a small cell out of 24 a day? What does that do to one's mind? It really depends on the person. I have a lot of experience working in prisons. Mm. I've worked with people that have been locked up for 23 hours a day. Some of them like it depending on the prison, depending on the rules of the prison, depending on the status of the prisoner. They can be in a little room, they have all their stuff, they have their TV, they have their books, they have their letters. They don't usually have internet access, but they can have a computer. Some of them can make a life in there. And for some people, it's not so unpleasant. For some of them, they have less frills, fewer frills, and it's not, maybe not as pleasant. But life in prison isn't necessarily a horrible thing. For some people that have fewer uh, mental, you know, less mental mm -hmm. stamina, mm -hmm. it's, it's more difficult. But it is a lifetime in prison and outside of society. Welcome back. We have Vivian Schneidman, one of my favorite guests. What's going on <laughs> next for Vivian Schneidman today? Well, I am in the process of trying to finish up my book. Oh, okay. Yes. I am writing my first big nonfiction book. Mm -hmm. um, it's called uh, Forensic Psychiatry, A Lawyer's Guide. Somewhat funny but sad, though. You have actual experiences that you use in this book? Yes. A lot of true stories that have been, you know, modified, fictionalized a little bit so that they, the cases can't be identified. There are patterns of deviant behavior based on organic problems right. and everything. I mean, we could certainly talk another time about psychopaths and you know right. people who really make choices to be deviant and evil. But most of the people that make these poor choices are not really making a choice. They're just behaving in ways that they don't know any better. And they're out there. They're out there. Uh, that, yeah. Yeah. And uh, you told me a long time, a true sociopath is rare. You don't even find them that much. Very few. Yeah. 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 They're, they're, they're interesting. Yeah. But and they're it could be dangerous. Very dangerous, very interesting, like mm -hmm. creepy, scary. We could, you know, have a whole show just about them. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know what's going on exactly in the minds, but we do know a few things that bird watching does to their minds. And we know it's really good for your brain. We know that bird watching is healthy, helps to keep your mind young, helps to keep your mind active. It strengthens, neuro, strengthens neural connections. We know that bird watching includes exercise, that you have to be able to pay attention to detail. And I guess people have all those things in common. They want to be able to pay attention to detail. They want to be able to um, put things into categories. They're capable of remembering things, like where to find a certain bird, what it looks like, how it flies, what kind of tree it grows in, or what it, likes to land true. in. It's true, they have these encyclopedic memories of, well, they have these books that they carry too, mm -hmm. but they seem to remember the names of the birds and the characteristics of the birds. And yeah, I'm at the point, I, I can barely even see the birds. Uh, I hear them in the woods, and then when, when, a, when a bird watcher points one out to me, I can see it. Yeah, and the bird watchers, not only do they see them and hear them, but they recognize them by the way that they fly, the way that they rustle the leaves, the sound of the rustling in the leaves, the sound of their whistling. I think some of them even understand the different kinds of calls and what they mean. So they're kind of learning the language of another species. And I think that's what attracts them, is this the way that some kids like to learn about worlds that are made up in science fiction, these people like to learn about a species that is not our own. Would you ever prescribe uh, uh, birding to a patient? I've never prescribed birding per se, but I do always prescribe exercise. I always prescribe being outdoors. I always prescribe exposing oneself to nature and sunshine. A lot of people don't ever want to do that. Sometimes I don't prescribe any medication and I know that that person is going, you know, to Dr. Joe down the street asking him for medication and they'll probably get it. I just wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I know I talked a little bit about the different sounds that they make and I know that birders do identify them by their sounds, and they always go like, "Oh, that's a you know yellow bill, whatever." And I think tap sucker, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I think it's so interesting. And I actually recently, right before I heard about this project, I had been speaking to a friend of mine who's an avid birder, and she's going to start teaching me mm -hmm. how to identify birds and how to become a bird watcher because I think it's so interesting. And I've always been fascinated by birds because they're you know the the current state of dinosaurs and I just think they're so cool and they can fly. The brain does have specialized cells for recognizing sound which we can recognize a little bit faster than visual stimuli and then in terms of visual stimuli there are specialized, I don't know if they're specialized cells for recognizing birds but there are specialized cells for recognizing movement, there's specialized cells for recognizing contrast, there's specialized cells for just all different kinds of things like you know, light and dark, not every, we think we just see color and that's what we see. But everything that we can possibly see has its own special brain mechanism. So I think that if people are out there watching birds, they're strengthening all of these special neural connections that maybe we don't use that much when we are just sitting in front of a computer screen all day. This woman is bulletproof. I don't think she's lost a case. Her name is Vivian Schneidman. So a forensic psychiatrist is a psychiatrist who specializes in the application of psychiatry to legal matters. So that could be any legal matter. It could be violent, criminally insane people, insanity defenses, could be divorce cases, custody cases, something called testamentary capacity, which is figuring out if somebody knew what they were doing when they wrote a will. Uh, those are actually my favorite cases, the ones of people that are already dead. And um, you have to recreate their mental status to figure out what was going on. I evaluate parents, I evaluate kids, I evaluate everybody. Anybody that has done something that l might look a little crazy and ends them up in a court. You really 
you don't want to be the person that needs a forensic psychiatrist to testify in your case in court. And what that means is that if you think there's something wrong in your life or in the life of a loved one or somebody close to you, when somebody seems odd or crazy, they probably are. And you should get professional help for them. Psychiatry is a very interesting specialty because there really is no there's no definitive test. There's no blood work. You can't really hook people up to a machine to see what's wrong with their brain. You can't use that thing from Star Trek, that wand or anything. That doesn't work for psychiatry. So all you really have is a clinical evaluation of the person. But the really important thing is that a clinical evaluation doesn't mean just what you tell me today. It means what you tell me today and then what everybody else around you and involved with you can tell me. I'll tell you something funny. People always say to me, oh, you talk to all these people and people tell you stuff because you're a psychiatrist. I think, knowing myself for all these years, I think that I became a psychiatrist because I had this knack mm -hmm. of understanding people and having people talk to me. It's really kind of sad because you know, everybody wants to be like that woman from CSI and to be called in the middle of the night. You know, there's a body lying in the field and then you rush out and you interview all these people. It's and dramatic. You solve all right. these mysteries and then, you know, you run their DNA and then boom, you, you know, you've solved this case and saved all these lives. And in reality, not only does it not happen, but even when you have a case that you strongly suspect there are dead bodies associated with this person, you can't do anything. I started to think that there were cases that he had completed. It wasn't likely that all he had ever done was three attempted rapes and got caught when he used to spend days and weeks and months literally living in his car, driving around looking for victims. Oh, yeah, yeah. And so I called the original county and I asked to speak to the arresting officer of the last case, which had been like 20 years earlier. And he was now like the chief of police for that whole township. And I said, is there any way, since all the, you know, the DNA gets put into database backwards. So if somebody today does a crime, the DNA evidence will be put into the state database. But if somebody did a crime 30 years ago, that is probably sitting somewhere in a, in a, in a box. box yeah. So I said, is there any way you can l pull up unsolved rape murders from that time? And also, one of the things we knew, you talked about the FBI training that I went to, which was great, great class. Um, one of the things that we learned is that you have to look at rapists' comfort zones. So this guy had convictions up in Bergen County and in Pennsylvania, like in, a, I think in Delaware, very big comfort zone that he was active in. So I said, is there any way you could look at this period of time for unsolved rape murders in, in these areas? Because I think that this is our man. Interesting. Pat, but there's Pat. Right? So right? So it, and it makes sense. And when you watch TV, they do it with one phone call. Well, he said, not only could he not ask for that, but without a court order, you can't run any of those. If the State Bureau of Investigation one day gets around to putting that old DNA into the database, there might be a hit. But if they don't, they don't. You can't approach a case in the way that they approach it on the shows. Mm -hmm. Like, if I know, like with this particular guy, I knew, I, I'm confident that there are grieving parents out there who still don't know when, what happened to their daughters and that this man was responsible for their deaths. But because they, they didn't pursue it, but this because doesn't there's show. No way, but there's no way in reality to pursue it unless you have some evidence that you can link right. this perpetrator to this unsolved crime. Most murders are not whodunits. People always ask me about serial killers. When I worked in the, um, in the sex offender prison and then I worked in the facility for the civilly committed sexually violent predators, they would always say, oh, do you have a lot of serial killers? And then, no, we don't really have any serial killers. Like even people that did more than one murder, they're not really serial killers. They're mostly people that just kill their victims so their victims don't talk.